we have a huge um, deficit of staff. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I that just ran a numbers crunch, I guess, for Bash Hallow. And so 35% of people that are in the profession now, the veterinarians and technicians, are thinking about quitting in the next five years. So if you, no matter how big you are, how much money yeah. you do at it, if there are not human beings to be in the profession, then we are going to really have a big struggle. And it's not too far down the road. We, we need to graduate more veterinarians. We need to be more diverse in our pool of veterinarians uh, and candidates. And we need to quit eating our young because that yes. is one of the bad parts of yes. That we are and we need to look at technology and efficiency. Absolutely. Because we're going to because, have to leverage yeah. this because we yeah. don't have the staff. No, that's that's exactly right. So and I mean I think I think also too it means practices um they've got to recognize the change in what employees want. And you can like that or not, you can agree with it or not, but it doesn't matter. It is there. And if you want to find people, you've got to recognize the need for mentoring, the need for work-life balance, you're going to have to pay them what they can get elsewhere, even if you think that's a ludicrous amount of money, you know, it just, um, yeah, it's, 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 and I mean, I, I think, I think certainly the amounts of money that corporate are offering is part of what's driving the sales to corporate. But I think some of it is people are like, I'm just tired of dealing with this, you know, and corporate can't solve all your management problems, but I mean, they are well equipped, you know, they've got great recruitment um, um, departments and people, you know, they've got hiring people. I mean, they, t they can take a lot yeah, of that yeah, off yeah, your yeah, shoulder. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Well, and, and I was having a talk with a young veterinarian today about insurance and for the business that she's going to work for. And I said, the problem is this is a 15 person entity and trying to find a group insurance yeah that is in any way, shape or form reasonable for 15 people is almost next to- It's person. really hard, yeah. The corporates do have that buying power of the large group to make you know, their, their benefit package. That's right. But you know, money isn't everything and working in a practice that you actually enjoy walking into every day means a great deal to people um, as long as they can make a living wage. And hello. My name is Debbie Boone, and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to Manage Vets Consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the bend. Today, I have a very special guest for us. She's probably one of the most well-known speakers in veterinary medicine, and this is Dr. Karen Felstad. Uh, Karen and I serve on the board of directors for Vet Partners together, and we have for several years, and we've been members together. So I'm really excited to uh, kind of twist her arm and break a little of her busy schedule off so that she can come and visit with us today. She is a veterinarian and a CPA, and she has spent the last 20 years working as a financial and operational consultant to veterinary practices and the animal health industry. She is active in multiple veterinary organizations. She has written an extensive number of articles for a wide range of publications and speaks regularly at national and international veterinary meetings. In 2011 and 2017, she was awarded the Western Veterinary Conference Practice Management Continuing Education of the, Educator of the Year and in 2014, the Vet Partners Distinguished Life Member Award. So Karen, thank you very much for taking time and squeezing me in 
I know our schedules are both a little nuts and uh, I think you know, 2020 might have made them worse than they had been. <laughs> they certainly made them different. Thank you for having me. I think this kind of thing is fun. Who doesn't like being invited to talk about themselves for an hour? So um, looking forward to it. All right. Well, I appreciate it. So let's start out with the first question here, which is my initial question. What did you want to be when you grew up? So, you know, my first answer would be probably what half the little girls out there want to be, which was a ballerina. But um, that became clear probably by the time I was 13 that that wasn't happening, right? And then somewhere in there, I did want to be a veterinarian. But um, I went to, I went to, there was a guy in our church who was a veterinarian, and I went to his practice one Saturday, and he was taking the dew claws off of these little puppies, and it was terrible. They cried, and they screamed, and they bled, you know, and I thought I was going to be sick to my stomach, and, you know, nobody said, um, you'll get over that. It's not a problem. Don't let that stop you, you know, and my, I have a great family. They'd support me in anything, but nobody was medically oriented. So again, there's nobody to say, hey, that's not an uncommon reaction. This isn't going to be a long-term problem, right? So I just thought, oh, can't do this, can't be a veterinarian. So um, I got, a, a, you know, I thought, so I was going to go to college and I'll get a business degree, you know, maybe an accounting degree because that's good everywhere. And so I am, um, I actually was going to get an accounting degree and then I didn't like that very well. So then I was going to get a computer science degree and then I bounced around from that. I actually ended up with a marketing undergraduate degree um, and didn't come back to veterinary medicine till later, till I was in my thirties. It was circuitous. That, that is definitely a, a, a <laughs> tricky path. It's so funny that you said that about the be, being a ballerina because up until the time I was in high school, I took tap, ballet, and jazz. Oh, wow. And I quit ballet the minute I got on point. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Those toe shoes are miserable. <laughs> They're brutal. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Oh, my yeah. God. But I, I still love to dance, but... Uh, yeah not not like that anymore not like that at all I did point work for two years but oh. I just wasn't as good and I wasn't as dedicated as the people that really do it you know oh, oh yeah you have to be incredibly yeah. committed to doing yeah. that well, I guess it was with anything if you're going to be proficient at it uh, to to do to dance and um man it's it's hard it is it's really challenging to look so effortless yes 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 and, and I think it's funny about you and the dew clause because the, almost the same thing happened to me. I, I wanted to be a veterinarian, went to my veterinarian, uh, and I would think I was like 14 and I was volunteering in his office. And the first thing they brought me back to show me was a huge mammary tumor that wow. needed to be removed. And the thing was as big as a softball. I mean, it was, and it was on a, a poodle. Yeah. They thought, well, okay, if she if she doesn't faint, <laughs> right. let her stay as a volunteer. And it didn't bother me. I was fascinated with it. So um, I, I didn't have the same reaction that you did, but I've seen some gross stuff in my life. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Move on through it. Um, so you, you've got your marketing degree and then... So I actually worked in, um, so then I went to work for um, Crested Butte Ski Resort in their marketing department. I actually did that part-time for my last year of college and traveled around and called on travel agencies and stuff. And then I did it full-time my first year out of school. And then they, um, I can't remember what happened, but they were they decided not to have a Texas rep anymore or something. So I then went to work for an airline because I wanted to stay in the travel industry. And I worked in reservations for a while because that's how you got into sales. Um, and then moved into their accounting department. And this has all been so long ago. I don't know why I did that, but it made sense at the time, you know. And then um, I got a master's in accounting and I went to work for one of the big eight accounting firms. And so that's really where my whole, the CPA part of my life came you know, came from, worked for ENY for six years, loved it. That was a great job. But then, you know, at, you're at some point, all of the big, a, and they're not big eight accounting firms anymore, but um, it's all, it's a pyramid, right? And it's up or out. And I hit a point and I just, I didn't think I had the skill set to keep going there. And so I, um, and I was in, in, you know, I was rethinking veterinary medicine. So 
um, went and I had to do a year's worth of pre-work and then went to vet school. Where did you go to vet school? Texas A&M. Texas A&M. And for me, because, you know, I was in my early 30s at this point. So now it's kind of like um, it had to be an in-state school because paying out-of-state tuition was just not going to be an option for me. So, but I was fortunate a and is a great school and I got in, so. Now I'm going to ask you, it's a little off script question here, but I'm curious because as an older person, I mean, 30 being older, but going right. into vet school, um, tell me, what did you see uh, that was maybe different or that you were able to better handle than somebody who was 20 something? Yeah, somebody? yeah, yeah. Well, I was lucky for one because A&M liked older students, second career students. They'd had good experience with them. And there were actually probably half a dozen in my class. There was a woman in my class who was a Broadway dancer. There was a woman, I mean, a guy in my class who'd been like a jet fighter pilot um, in the Air Force or whatever. Um, there was a guy that had, was an attorney. So a bunch of people that were doing this as a, as a second career. And um, I think A&M probably liked us as students because you know we are probably calmer we're more dedicated we work harder just because you know when you go back to school in your 30s it's like I can't screw around I can't screw this up you know what I mean I've got a I've got a it's a major commitment and it's a financial commitment and and I've just given up a great job as an accountant so um you know and so I probably didn't get all of the um you know, like A&M has all these Aggie traditions and fun things people do and that kind of stuff. And I, I'm sure I didn't socialize as much as most of the class and everything. And I was working at a veterinary practice um, during part of that as well. So I was highly focused on school. Mm -hmm. But I think some of that just came from where I was at in my life. Yeah, yeah I've got to ask, so switching from a very stable job as an accountant to going back to vet school, what was the scariest part of that for you? You know, it, it didn't, it didn't seem that scary. The weird, because I felt like, and, and this be different, you know, 25 years ago than it is now, but I didn't have, and some of it just may be me as a personality, but I didn't really have any concerns that I couldn't make a go of this, you know, um, I, I, I didn't have to borrow a ton of money because this was back in the days when it didn't cost as much to go to veterinary school. So I didn't come out with a ton of debt. I knew I could get a job. Um, I, I guess just getting through it was the scariest part, but I don't remember that as being like totally terrifying or anything. Um, I just, I felt good about it. I, I didn't think any of this was going to be a problem. That doesn't mean you're not going to have hardships. You know, when I went to do my pre-work and I had to do, I don't know, five different classes in a semester or something. And I got some counselor there who's like, oh no, you can't possibly do these five different classes. You know, you need to do three and stretch this out over two years. I'm like, not happening, you know, and I did it and it was fine. Um, so, you know, I, I guess, I think you have to know what you want and have confidence in yourself. But um, probably the scariest thing is just getting admitted, right? Yeah, yeah. But I did. So I got lucky on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got admitted to the school you needed to go to because... Yeah, exactly. The, I exactly. mean, I, I remember when I was at NC State, um, I laughed and said my tuition was $465. A yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, of course, $400 back then was, you know, the equivalent of several thousand now, but right, right. it was so doable as an in-state student and um yeah such a challenge now with the, the veterans and the school yeah. and the lack of funding and then that debt yeah. we, we talk a lot about that in our yeah. world a lot i um, think the academics scared me a little bit at the beginning and and actually probably all through school and that's part of the reason i spend a lot of time studying because mm -hmm. it just you know it, it, you just can't fail that's not an option, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Um, so did you uh, then get out of school and, and work in practices for a while? I did. So I worked in small animal and emergency practice for about three years. And then um, 
I, I, I actually, and I was doing some consulting work on the side, some and and some practice accounting work and that kind of stuff. And I was trying to, I hit a point where it's like you need to do one or the other because it's too hard keeping up with the expertise of both. But I couldn't decide what to do. And then I fell and broke my arm ice skating, and I broke my right arm. I'm right handed, and. I don't know, that just sort of seemed to make the decision because it was going to be too hard to keep practicing at the time. And so I went the business route and I really liked the business side of it. I was good at it, you know, because of all my business and TPA background and that kind of stuff. And there was a need for it. So um, I, I haven't practiced since then. But I think the fact that I've been in practice, it, it makes people comfortable because I am a veterinarian. I do know what it's like. And, you know, you don't need to be a veterinarian for a lot of the business, excuse me, the business consulting work. Um, because, you know, HR is HR, whether it's a hardware store or a veterinary practice. I mean, some of the nuances can be different, but but still there's a comfort level. I'm a part of the club, you know, and that's that's been helpful. So, yeah, yeah. I agree with that because you can just, it's a lived experience. Yeah. And when those people come to you and they go, oh, but my client's doing A, B, and C, and you go, oh, totally, I've been there. You get it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I and work. whether that's that's being a veterinarian or having just worked in a practice mm -hmm. for a long time, I mean, because that's your background, right? Oh, and yeah. that gives you the same experience. Yeah. 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 In the practice. Yeah. So you um, were doing consulting, but you went to work with a consulting group, right? For a while. I did. Um, and, and that was part of what gave me the confidence to, to make that decision to go fully into the consulting, because I started doing some work for Bracky Consulting and um, they had, um, <coughs> that ended up being a great opportunity. And there just was, um, and actually I take it back. I think I'm mixing up my, my, um, time frame here a little bit I actually went to work for um Owen McCafferty sorry I got this has been a while you know but um I met um I was kind of casting around trying to meet people in the management world and that kind of stuff and um I met Marsha Heinke who was um Owen's partner at the time and um at a meeting and she's like oh you need to introduce yourself to Owen and I did at a conference and he was interested in opening a Dallas office so I started this Dallas office for him and um and that ended up just being a great opportunity because I got a ton of experience there I got clients um, I started doing a lot of speaking and that was really something I developed on my own. That wasn't so much through Owen, but people were um, looking for speakers. I had done a little bit, a couple of talks with Bracky. That was where the Bracky connection came in early. Um, and so I started doing a lot of speaking, a lot of writing. I mean, just there were a lot of opportunities out there. And I don't mean to sound like, like this was totally easy, because I worked my butt off, no matter what it was I was doing, you know, but the opportunities were there if you were willing to do that. Yeah, I agree. So I didn't know we had the Owen connection because when I started managing my very first hospital, Owen was our consultant. And um, my practice owner would, we'd get into some kind of conundrum and we go, call Owen. And I'll go, okay. So I would call Owen and ask him questions. And then I think one of the most, um, I tickled I have been as I saw Owen somewhere and he said, I follow you on Facebook. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Owen was following me on Facebook. And he said, I'm yeah. so proud of what you've done. I went, oh my yeah. God, that, that means so much to me coming from you. Yeah. He was just, no, he's an icon. Oh, yeah. He, is. he absolutely is. And you know, um, I mean, I think we, you know, I don't know about you but I certainly fangirl over people and I know that that when I first met you I was like oh, I <laughs> you know um and now we're friends but you know it was that first meeting was like this is somebody I've read my whole well no and I I felt that like about um um uh Cynthia Witchett and certainly about Owen and Marsha you know and I can remember Mark Opperman coming and speaking at my vet school you know and I was like oh my god you know and then you get to meet him and this kind of stuff no it is so funny yeah yeah it is funny and then people you know oh I follow you and I read your stuff and I'm like really I how do you even know who I am I mean I still kind of feel like that um 
yeah that that I, I don't even know how that happens sometimes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no no, no I don't know. Go, wow how did I even get here from where I was but yeah um so obviously there's always bumps in the road and you then decided to go out and and be Panthera tea uh, yes I did and I um I did, I did work with Bracky and everybody, consultants with Bracky were independent contractors. So I did some work on my own. I did some work through Bracky. Um, and then um, I spent a few years with Gavin McPherson and then I got offered the job at the National Commission on Veterinary Economic Issues, which was just an amazing opportunity. So I lived in Chicago for three years and I was not doing practice consulting at the time, but I was doing NCBEI stuff. And then NCBI decided to merge into the AVMA, so my position went away. So then I came back into consulting. Um, and that's when I, I mean, my company's always been called Felstead Veterinary Consultants, but I rebranded it as Panthera T. So now for the last, what, probably 10 years, that's that's what I've been doing. Although I've done consulting on again, off again in various forms through most of this career post being a veterinarian, practicing as a veterinarian. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about starting a business. I mean, you, you're right. You had the knowledge and you certainly had the acknowledgement from people around you, but still starting a business from scratch is a yeah. <laughs> Well, it is. And I was fortunate that I didn't have that student debt situation. You know, I mean, I paid my debt off at like 350 bucks a month over 10 years. So, I mean, it was, you know, easy. Um, I was really lucky on the debt. And some of that is that it just costs less to go to vet school at the time. Some of it, I was definitely frugal, you know, during vet school. And like my last year in vet school, they had an opportunity where you could live in these apartments above the small animal clinic. And there were eight or nine of us, I forget, maybe eight. And we we would do the overnight call, but for both the large animal and the small animal department, and then you got to live rent free. So that definitely helped, you know. Um, but so I didn't have a ton of debt. I had like 30,000. And of course, you know, with the debt loads that we're talking about now, that just seems like minuscule, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it was just easy enough to pay off. But um, the, the, I think I always, you know, when I, when I, when I started consulting. I did a little on my own, but then I was with Owen. So I was an employee there. When I left Owen, then I connected with Bracky. Um, and I just, I had a comfort level. I had enough clients, I guess, on my own. And I had a comfort level that they would have, um, they'd bring some work or point some work in my direction. Plus I'd develop a certain amount of it on my own. Um, it just, I always felt like I could pay my bills before I took the next step. You know, not necessarily get rich over it, but pay my bills, right? And I think that gave me the confidence to take whatever the next step was. That's harder to do now with the debt situation, depending on what your debt repayment program is. Certainly if you're on an income-based repayment it's a little different, but I mean, I think that applies now. And I, I, I worked at the emergency clinic for a while while I was doing some of this. I mean, there were certainly part of the time that I was practicing, I was practicing half time and doing consulting half time. And I always knew too, that if I needed to go back and do shifts at the emergency clinic, I could, you know, or you could work relief. And so, I mean, I think, I think even now that's still true, right? If you want to go and try something different as a veterinarian, you can always go work relief. You can always go do emergency clinic shifts. So, you know, if you need to, to support yourself, it's harder if you own a house, it's harder if you have children, all those kinds of things. And actually I did own a house in part of that. I never had children. So um, um, I had manageable expenses, let's put it that way. And there was always an opportunity to earn more money if I needed. But you know, there was a lot of need out there for consulting. I was doing a lot of speaking and writing, so I got a lot of, I got a lot of exposure. Um, there's a lot of need for financial consulting, and since that's my area of expertise, it just worked, you know. And then when I when I left NCBI and it merged into ABMA and came back into Panthera T, I just I'd been doing it for so long. I was well established at that point 
I was just, I've been lucky. I've never, I've never had a time where I was seriously concerned about where the next, the next job was coming from. I think that's getting harder these days in consulting because so many practices are getting sold, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think it depends on the kind of consulting you do as well. I think people are very uncomfortable with finances. Mm -hmm. So they'll hire somebody to appraise their practice or help them understand their finances. It's like they're not comfortable writing their own legal documents, right? For general consulting, and you would know this better than I do, I think that can be harder, you know, because people go, oh, I can do my own marketing. I can do my own HR, but. But they, but they don't do it well. They, everybody can do it, but it's doing it right. well. Is that right. Right. your time appropriately? And, you know, so that brings it back to kind of a financial thing is it's work smart, not hard and do drive revenue rather than doing book work. And yeah, I've been in practices where the practice owner is, writing payroll and paying bills and like you know why are you doing that that's maybe a 25 to 30 dollar an hour job and you're a 200 dollar an hour person so yeah you be doing right and driving revenue into the practice and not doing management stuff um you know i i really appreciate the fact that you talked about the financial stuff because when i was a manager i I mean, you guys were the Bible, right? You wrote these articles and I read them all the time because there was not a place to get educated. Yeah, yeah. Practices. And so I know that I've been a member of the HMA since forever. <laughs> yeah. 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 They say, I think you might be our oldest member. Or our oldest member. <laughs> but I really did join it like in 1987. And then I took a break and, and, um, and rejoined it back in the 90s. But you know, that information was so valuable to me as a manager, because otherwise you were just working in a vacuum. You only knew your stuff. And so all this, the data, particularly that you um, have brought to the table as far as big picture stuff. So I'm curious as to how, I know you got involved with, um, you know, a Partners for Healthy Pets, and you've in some of these really big initiatives that happened in vet medicine and the um, the study, the um, veterinary usage study. So yeah, the yeah. bear veterinary care usage study. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in those things. And you know, to me, I'm looking at those things and going, what an overwhelming project. Yeah, and and I mean, some of this, you know, I was good at what I did. I mean, these these were you know, areas that I knew a lot about. Um, And some of it is right place, right time, you know, because actually um, um, John Volk at Brackey was the one that initiated and put together the whole Bayer Veterinary Care Usage Study idea and talked to Bayer about it. And they were interested and then said, I was with NCVI at the time, said, let's bring NCVI into it because that'll bring some credibility and some exposure to it and this and that and the other. And, you know, Karen's good at this and that kind of stuff. So, um, I mean, it was a great opportunity for me. I was working with Bracky at the time that we did the Pfizer Business Management Study too, which was, I don't know, probably 10 years before the Bayer study. Um, Partners for Healthy Pets was, I don't even know how I got involved with that. Um, Somebody just reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to come do some stuff for us, you know? And so Karen Gavser and I did some some joint speaking for that. You know, I think this is one of the hard things about being a consultant on your own, because once you're reasonably well-known, a lot of opportunities come your way. It's how do you get to that point? And, you know, I feel like, you know, there wasn't any time where I was worried about whether I could you know, um, you know, have money to eat or anything like that. You know, it's not like being a dancer, like we were talking about where you're starving to death, you know. Um, But I think I lived frugally. And that makes a lot of opportunities possible that aren't if you don't live frugally. Mm -hmm. And I also busted my butt, you know, Mm -hmm. every time somebody called and said, do you want to write an article? Do you want to be interviewed for this article? Do you want to speak at this conference? Even if if it wasn't overly convenient for me, or, you know, it's crashing into my so-called work-life balance. Early in my career, I did that because that's kind of what you have to do to build you know, to build a brand, I guess, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and then some of that stuff just comes to you because you're 
you're there, they know how to find you, they know what you're talking about, you're easy to work with, you say yes to things. Um, I'm reasonable on what I charge, you know, I'm not the cheapest consultant out there, but I know I'm not the most expensive either. Um, so affordable. Um, and I struggle with what that's supposed to look like, just like many <laughs> <Don't> we all. <laughs> we all do, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know if that's answering your question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just think that um, you know, and part of that that networking, you know, it's like you said, you got you get known, and yeah, networking to me is, is a huge part of building a business, and yes. I think that. I see people who don't want to talk to their sales reps or they want to stay in their comfort zone. And I actually had Eric Garcia on and Eric says, you know, I'm really introverted. And so Louise Dunn invited him to his first net partners meeting. And he said, I just wanted to go back and hide in my room. <laughs> right. right. Like, well, you need to come down here. And he's like, I don't really want to do that. So it's sometimes, even though it's not your nature, you yeah. take yourself out of your comfort zone and go and, and meet people and then you don't meet people so that they can do stuff for you you go and meet people so that maybe you can do something for them yeah and then it all kind of comes back it because comes I, back yeah I, I love matchmaking I love you know referring back and forth I've certainly referred to you for certain situations that some clients get into and they ask me about stuff and they're like oh this is above my pay, pay grade yep. let me get somebody that can do that for you yep. um but it, it, the value of networking. I mean, do you feel like that is one of the obvious things? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm half of my personality is just like Eric, you know, and it's like at the end of the day or after I'm finished speaking, I'm like done, you know, going to sit in my room and order room service and not talk to anybody. Um, but I like talking to people as well. And, you know, when it comes to networking, like Bet Partners was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I was, this is, you know, a thousand years ago, because Bet Partners has been around for what, 21 years or something now. Yeah. yeah. And I went to the very first Bet Partners meeting before it was even an organization in San Antonio. And our major focus there was talking about practice valuations. And I was um, just starting to do those and had a big interest in them and the, some of the technical aspects behind them. And there was some controversy in the profession at the time about how those were being done. And um, um, and then, you know, out of that came Bet Partners. And I guess we met at um, what was CBC Kansas City, maybe a few months after that and whatever, it became Bet Partners. But that was, you know, that was such a cool opportunity because um, most of the well-known consultants out there belong to Vet Partners. And so not only did I get to meet some of these icons, but I also just met a ton of people. And they're, you know, they're people that have become friends, that have become colleagues, that they refer work, I refer work to them. But also if I have a question about something, I can call and say, hey, what do you think about X? And that's that has been just an amazing opportunity. I, I but think, I think that, networking is critical. Yeah, I, I agree with you that, that I joined Vet Partners maybe six or seven years. I feel like I've been in it a lot longer than I actually have been in it, but I felt like I was walking into the Academy Awards that first day I was there. I was like, oh my gosh, look at all these people who I've, I've been listening to for all these years. But then you find out that they're just really great people. And yeah, totally. Yeah. And that they are, you know, they're, they're here to help the profession. And for anybody who's listening, who doesn't know what we're talking about, Vet Partners is the Association of Consultants and Advisors. And we have about 300 members now of people who are working uh, kind of in the periphery of the veterinary profession, where we help with, as Karen said, valuations. Uh, I focus on HR on consulting, marketing, HR marketing, uh, technology, uh, website design, you name it. We have a little bit of everybody and there's a really diverse group, but, um, and, and there is a, a code of ethics that goes with it to, you know, so we, we have a, a group of people who says, this is, we're going to do it and we're going to do it right. And if we, we're not going to misrepresent ourselves to clients uh, and say, we can do stuff, but we can't do, you know, so we are, we're a group of, of fun, networking, honest group. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so Karen, um, I, I want to backtrack a little bit about um, the NCVI because 
I just love that. I just thought that was just the best information ever. And it was so sad that it got pulled in. And that was really your baby, right? So tell me a little bit about how that all developed and so, and I was actually the second CEO for NCBI. Howard Rubin was the first, or actually, I think there was an interim one right at the beginning when they put it together. But it was um, originally pulled together after, I think after the KPMG study came out. And the KPMG study was like, great profession, but, you know, here's some challenges. You need to deal with this. And so NCBI was a, the, it was, sponsored, if you will, or supported by um, AAVMC, which is the group of the veterinary colleges, the American Animal Hospital Association, and the AVMA. And um, Howard Rubin was their first CEO. And so they focused a lot on, on trying to provide financial information to veterinarians, and they were trying to keep it simple. And Howard used to always say, I just want people to be able to stick their toe in. Um, and, you know, get a little bit of information, and now they have some understanding about how better to run their practice, and then, um, and I forget how long Howard was there, but um, probably five or six years, and then at some point, um, it was time, he wanted to, to move on and do something different, so they did a search, I'm, I don't know who all they interviewed, um, but I was one of them, and it was just an amazing opportunity. It was very different. You know, if we're going to talk about probably the hardest time in my professional career, that first year with NCVI was probably it, because it was very different. I wasn't doing private practice consulting. Um, we had some, we found that as time had marched on, there were some real technology issues with the NCBI website. So some of the data wasn't as strong as maybe everybody had hoped that it was. And so we had to spend a lot of time rebuilding the website. And, you know, I'm not a technology person. So I was like, oh my God, whoever thought I'd have to learn about this stuff, you know, but then in the same time, you know, you're out there and we want to keep NCBI relevant and vibrant and sharing information with veterinarians. So that's honestly where I started becoming, um, extremely knowledgeable about all the different studies that have been done in veterinary medicine. And, you know, there's a zillion of them. And, and I just became one of those people who really did know a lot about that. And part of that is I was having to do that to have something to talk about while we were rebuilding the, the NCVI website, right? And then could talk about NCVI data. Um, so some of it is, you know, you just do it because you got to, right? Um, but um, uh I love, I love the backstory to that, that, that it, you know, that, you know, it was all because I guess this is like, I had a question about what is like your greatest failure and your greatest mistake. Yeah, it's yeah. Like it's failure, but the failure ended up right. being a really positive thing because you became like this data guru. <laughs> this data guru because, and I had to, I had to do something, you know, <laughs> so, um, and it worked out great because I actually loved um, I loved following all of those studies and saying, okay, how do you take this information? What do you do in your practice? That kind of stuff. And of course, that's part of the reason then that like we got approached to be a part of the, the Bayer study and everything. But um, so, so revamped the website, um, had some better data and that kind of stuff. But I think at some point, like with organizations like that, they're never meant to have a life forever. And I think that um, it was probably around 10 years, something like that. Um, I was there the last three or so. And just at some point, you know, AHA wanted to do something different. Um, ABMA wanted to do something different. So ABMA folded it into their organization. They kept the website up for a while, but then they just went a different route. And I, like I said, it's kind of like Partners for Healthy Pets, right? You know, it's, I mean, it's still there. You can get information from it, but it's not as active as it used to be. I think that initiatives like that have kind of a life Mm -hmm. the life cycle, you know, and so I loved it. It was a great opportunity for me. I learned a ton from it. Um, I got great exposure and that kind of stuff, um, but not a total surprise that it it wasn't going to last forever. Well, you know, that I look at that um, data gathering, and it was it was a difficult data gathering, right? Because it was you know it was old school, and it wasn't just so yeah. simple, like we should just like. Yeah. We look at vet success now and they just pull stuff Suck it out yep. yeah and we don't even have to go through all that you know answering yep. surveys 
things and things like that. That's right. Um, you know, one of the things I do want to ask you about, because I know you value practices and, and consolidation and corporatization is certainly on everybody's radar in veterinary medicine. And somebody asked me uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, what I thought the future held for veterinary medicine as far as corporate practices go and, and percentages. So you are the numbers queen. <laughs> Tell me what you think in five years, what do you think the percentage of corporate practices are going to be? You know, I think this is a really interesting topic because, um, and I, I mean, I don't, not sure my crystal ball is any better than anybody else's. Okay. But um you know, we've probably got, depending on who you talk to, because there's no big master list, mm -hmm. somewhere between 65, maybe even 75 groups buying practices. You know, every time I turn around, there's like another group and I'm like, I've never heard of them, I you know? know. Um, right. yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and so, I mean, that's a lot of interest in veterinary medicine. Of course, this isn't a new thing, right? But it's certainly over the last, I don't know what, three to five years hit a real peak. Like Feeding you know, frenzy. Like what? a feeding frenzy. That's exactly right. And so so I think everybody agrees it's a bubble, but I think what there's not a clear understanding are about is like how long does that bubble last? I mean, you know, to put this in perspective, and of course when the pandemic hit, um uh, you know, I don't think any of us had any idea what that was going to mean in veterinary medicine. And then for us related fields like you and I who are doing consulting work, you know, and, you know, I'd say for the first month or two um, after the pandemic, my new client calls slowed, didn't go away, but slowed. And then it picked back up, right? I am busier than I've ever been in my career. But what's interesting about that is that I probably used to do 50% transition work. So buying, selling, startup, practice startups, I'm probably doing 90% of that now. Um, and it's, it's the, the corporate groups definitely paused when the pandemic hit, but two months later, I mean, they just roared back. And some of the prices out there are just beyond belief, you know, if you have the right kind of practice. So trying to come back to your question, um, you know, and again, there's not great data out there on this, but, you know, I think for a while people were saying maybe, you know, 18 to 20% of practices were owned. It's got to be higher than that now. So maybe it's 25%, but that's number of practices. If you look at revenue, you know, my guess is probably what 30% of revenue is owned because they like the bigger practices, maybe more than 30%. Um, and I, I haven't gone through my list recently and like tried to assign numbers to that. But, and I think, of course, if you look at like specialty and emergency, it's 50 or 60% of the revenue is owned by corporate groups. It's less certainly for companion animal practices, less for equine and um, um, the mix. large animal and mixed. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's, it is, it's like you said, it's a feeding frenzy right now. At some point that's gonna stop because the practices that people want are going to be all bought up or the people just aren't willing to sell at this point because they're 35 and then what are they going to do right you know so because still right now probably 60 percent of our practices are one and two doctor practices most corporate groups don't want that right not that they don't occasionally buy them but they're too small they're too small mm -hmm. yeah and so so i mean at some point once every single larger practice is owned or the people are just not at a stage that they want to sell the frenzy has to go down. So then, and, and when you talk to people, you know, I'd say people tell me they think it's, I don't know, two years to five years that the frenzy goes on. I had one of the corporate groups told me they thought we were in the middle of the innings. Um, I think the interest rates are going to have an effect on that too, because interest rates, as long as they stay this historically low, money is so cheap. Money is cheap. And of course, not all of this money is bank debt money. You know, some of that is equity money. Mm -hmm. So some of it's going to depend on how dependent the group is on borrowed money. You know, the other thing that I think is interesting is what everybody quote unquote says is that we're going to see this big consolidation of the consolidators, which I agree that's going to happen. And, it's, and, you know, we've certainly seen some of that happen already, but here's the part I don't get. And I'm having trouble getting an answer on this and honestly i think it's because nobody really knows you know but so if we have 70 groups buying 
practices. I mean, are we saying that there'll be 10 left standing when this is all done? But that's an enormous disruption to go from 70 practices to 10. So, so I don't see how that could happen in, I don't know, three to five years. That, that just doesn't seem reasonable to me. So maybe it's 10 years. Yes. Maybe I don't know. It's but a really challenging thing. You know, if we look at distribution and we look at pharma, we yep. see that we used to have 15 or 20 distributed yes. companies. And we don't. But last week, Patterson bought Miller. Yep. So we're, we're, we're narrowing that funnel down yep. and it's become more and more limited uh, as those companies buy each other out. And I think that this is, you know, this is a, just a pattern, a corporate pattern. Yeah that they're the big fish by the little fish and yep. then expand on it. But, you know, it's yep. really interesting to uh, have conversations with veterinarians who want to sell their practices. And some of them are, are just hell bent. They would never sell to a corporate. Um, they think they're the devil. Others go, you know what, I'll listen. Anybody's going to come up with, you know, 10 times multiple. out money, <laughs> money talks money here. Talks. Exactly. I'm yeah. listen to that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what I've been getting is people who want to uh, either have a corporate come and, you know, buy out their practice and they are prepping for it because I've talked to, you know, I have friends like you who are in these consolidation groups and talk to them about what they're looking for. Yes. People are not just looking for uh, a practice that's doing X amount of dollars. Those, those practices have to have management in place. They have to have a culture that doesn't have constant churn and turnover. They have to have a stable client base. They're, they're looking at their reviews on Google and Facebook. To yeah. see if they have a good reputation in the community, their building can't be falling apart. Right. And, and when veterinarians, if you're, they're looking to sell, if they're not paying attention to all these factors rather than just, you know, I'm driving this much revenue, nobody's going to touch you. So yeah. that was going to touch you. So that's the opportunity, I think, for independent practice owners, for young veterinarians coming out to take what I call the, the fire sale or the bargain basement practices and then go and revitalize those practices. That Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Bad yeah. for the practice owner because this is their retirement. Yeah. But if they did not nurture their nest egg then they are going to be burnt on the, on the yes. end of this ride. Yes. And uh, yes. it's really important to, you know, financially, sometimes you think you can't afford it, but then you can't afford not to. Not to agree. Agree. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, uh, it's interesting. I, it's, it's hard to picture what this is going to look like in three years, five years, 10 years. I think in 10 years, it's going to look radically different. I think, I think it is. Yeah. I think, well, you know, we we have a huge um, deficit of staff, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. I just met, just ran a numbers crunch, I guess, for Bash Hallow, and said thirty five percent of people that are in the profession now, the veterinarians and technicians, are thinking about quitting in the next five years. So, if you, no matter how big you are, how much money yeah. you do at it, if there are not human beings to be in the profession then we are going to really have a big struggle and it's not too far down the road. We, we need to graduate more veterinarians. We need to be more diverse in our pool of veterinarians uh, and candidates. And we need to quit eating our young because that's yes. one of the bad parts of yes. the profession is that we are. And we need to look at technology and efficiency. Absolutely. Because we're going to have to leverage yeah. the tech because we yeah. don't have the staff. No, that's, that's exactly right. So, and I mean, I think, I think also too, it means practices, um, they've got to recognize the change in what employees want and you can like that or not, you can agree with it or not, but it doesn't matter. It is there. And if you want to find people, you've got to recognize the need for mentoring, the need for work-life balance. You're going to have to pay them what they can get elsewhere, even if you think that's a ludicrous amount of money. You know, it just, um, yeah, it's, 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 and I mean, I, I think, I think certainly the amounts of money that corporate are offering is part of what's driving the sales to corporate. But I think some of it is people are like, I'm just tired of dealing with this, you know, and corporate can't solve all your management problems. But I mean, they are well-equipped, you know, they've got 
great recruitment um, um, departments and people, you know, they've got hiring people. I mean, they, t they can take a lot yep, of that off your is. shoulder. Yep, yeah. 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 Well, and, and I was having a talk with a young veterinarian today about insurance and for the business that she's going to work for. And I said, the problem is this is a 15 person entity and trying to find a group insurance yeah. that is in any way, shape or form reasonable for 15 people is almost next to it. It's really hard. Yeah. The corporates do have that buying power of the large group to make, you know, their, their benefit package. That's right. But, you know, money isn't everything and working in a practice that you actually enjoy walking into every day means a great deal to people um, as long as they can make a living wage. And yeah, so talking to Liz Houston about the veterinary technician union and yes. I see a lot of, of that and mainly driven by the amount of corporates that are coming in because they feel like they need a voice um and for this like large power rather than just the single doctor practice but um i think the market is going to drive the rates of pay up and it is already driving the rates of pay yeah yeah come and well because real i mean when you think about it like who can live on forty thousand dollars a year I mean, that's not a livable wage, you know, for one person, much less a couple, you know, or somebody and a child or whatever. I mean, you know, I mean, really being a technician or a receptionist or an assistant or something that really only works if that is a second income and there's another really strong income. Exactly. In a, in a practice, you know, and I just, I think, I think, um, you know, I hate to, I don't mean to say exactly money's become more important to people, but in a way, I think that's true. It's not so much the money per se, but it's the things that they want to do with it. So you need your iPhone, you need your computer, you know, you need your granite, whatever countertops, you know, um, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it is definitely um, a knowledge is power. So you have people over here going, well, Hey, well, I'm making 25 or $30 an hour. And then these other people are going, well, I'm getting paid 15. Yeah, well, exactly. Groups that are sharing this information together, they're really kind of getting to see how they're getting burnt. And, and yeah. if one can pay, then the other should be able to pay because the business is the business, right? And it just means, and, and of course, I'm certainly preaching to the choir when you are looking at people's books and you know how much stuff they give away or don't charge appropriately for, or there's I just got through reading an article where receptionists stole 147,000. Yeah, right, 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 right. And and putting a system in place that makes yeah. it impossible or on next to impossible to do uh, in practices. So there's so much room for capture, existing revenue and keeping what you've got so that you can pay your people, you know, what they deserve to be paid. Yeah, yeah you know, out there in the world. So yep, agree, agree. So Karen, um, you, you've obviously made some major leaps. At <laughs> yes. <the time>. True. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was, you yeah. never say, you never graduate high school and go, I think I'll be a veterinary practice management consultant. You no, know, exactly right. You know, I remember the very first time I went to VMX, well, it wasn't VMX then, right? It was in ABC. Yeah, yeah. And I saw um, Karen Gavzer give a talk, and it was 2000. It was on wellness plans, and she was standing up there at the front. And, you know, I said, in my mind, you know, you know how you had these random thoughts. Yeah. I, said, I think I might like to do that one day. Uh huh. Uh huh. Not having any clue how yeah. many times I would be standing in front of an audience. Right, like, oh, right, right. That. But, you know, sometimes I think we just have those random thoughts and then there's a goal set and then it somehow it just starts to manifest as long as you keep, as you said, you just keep working at it. You just keep yeah. taking the risk. You just grab the opportunities and you say, yes, you might not know how to do it, but a hundred percent or even 50%, <laughs> but sometimes you'll figure it out. You know, just, just take you, it. Do it. Yes. Yes. Yes, you do figure it out, you know, you got to really want to do it. And I mean, I, you know, I think a certain amount of work is showing up, right? And and that I mean that in a very broad sense, which um, I mean, you got to be willing, if you want to make a change, 
particularly one that's got some risk to it. I mean, you've got to be willing to bust your butt. Doesn't mean you have to bust your butt forever. And trust me, I'm a believer in work-life balance. And honestly, I don't think I've always helped myself with as much as I've worked, you know, there's got to be a, a better way, but it also buys you a ton of flexibility. It does. It absolutely does. So I'm going to ask you, do you have words of wisdom, advice that you would give somebody who's kind of facing this career decision and trying to figure out where to move forward or, you know, how to how to yeah. fear? Because a lot of this is fear. A lot of it is fear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and of course, you know, now, now, you know, I end up sounding like an old <laughs> grumpy dinosaur, right? Um, but and, you know, people don't always want to hear dinosaurs' points of view, but um, I think that, you know, I think there's a couple of things. One, I think I think you start thinking about it, and I'm a big believer that um, you can't push making a decision. I think at some point you will know, right? Um, but I also feel like, I mean, make it possible for yourself, and that really comes back to some of the things that I was talking about, you know, so if you can live frugally, whatever, you know, whether you're single, married, raising children or not, if you can live frugally, you have more opportunities out there because you're not tied to, you know, I, I can't drop this salary even for a year kind of a thing. So that helps, um, you know, be willing to bust your butt and to do what it takes doesn't mean you have to give up work life balance forever. But realistically, I mean, if you're if you're a practicing veterinarian and you want to move into corporate, you're not working any less hours in corporate, you know, and and you just got to be realistic about that. But there's a ton of opportunities out there and there's a ton of flexible opportunities. So if you want to start a practice, but, you know, you're concerned about whether it'll bring in enough the first year so you can do some some, you know, some some emergency shifts or something you know does that make for a long day yeah does anybody really want to do that no but does it make something possible that might not otherwise be possible um and i think it's saying yes to a ton of opportunities too and so if you know, like I come back to, you know, I did a ton of speaking and writing where I did not get paid in the early days, you know, and, and it's, you know, would I be less willing to do that now? Yes, that's true. But I still do some of it for the right people and the right groups and stuff. It's just kind of part of contributing to the profession. But I mean, I think it's being willing to do some of those things. I think it's focusing on what can I do for you rather than what you can do for me. Mm -hmm. It, and and you have, um, you can focus more on what you can do for me, the more established and the farther on you are. Yes. Yeah. But in the early days. Yeah. In the early days, is you got to grind it. You, you got to really, grind it. You really do. And I know that's the, that's the most dinosaur advice out there, right? Mm -hmm. It's true. You know, but, but it's true. Real, realistic expectations. Um, you know, I think we have maybe not truly set realistic expectations for what it is like to be in the veterinary profession, especially working in clinics, and that when people get in there and they realize how challenging working with other people is, working mm -hmm. with the public is, you know, I've been working with the public since I was 10 years old, and mm -hmm. I grew up in a restaurant, so I was always there, and, and the public never changes, and people think, oh, the public has gotten more difficult. Well, yeah, during COVID, they did. They got they did. They got a bit here. But yeah. there are always examples of that in, yeah. in, in any business. So that I always laugh and say that hangry thing, you know, in the yeah. room, it's real. <laughs> yeah. are, they're, they're gripey. But, you know, we need to be realistic with people going into the profession. We need to be very practical because I think sometimes we are also teaching veterinarians that if, unless it's gold standard, it's you can't do it. Um, yeah. So to see yeah. but sometimes you have to do the best you can with what you have to work with yep yep and, and I mean we have to meet minimum medical standards yeah. I get that yeah. but not everybody wants or can afford the gold standard so no and you know I think you mentioned the pandemic and I think this is really important I think when you're thinking about you know I'm hating life I'm hating what I'm doing now I do think you excuse me have to sort out is that because the last year has completely sucked or is that 
I really don't like this and it's time to move on? Or is it, okay, I like practicing clinical medicine, but I don't like this clinic. And is there a better opportunity? Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't remotely see how this kind of growth and this kind of demand can continue. Um, I mean, it sure is now, but at some point it's not, you yeah. know? And so, so things are going to slow down. I don't think people are going to lose their revenue, but they're going to slow down. We're not going to see these, this massive growth and that kind of stuff. Um, well, people as, are gonna, they're going to go back to getting Starbucks and yep. shopping for clothes yep. and paying for gas and going out to lunch and all and the schools will open. So people don't have to stay home with their kids. Yeah. And all the disposable income that yeah exactly house, and they said oh yeah let's do it for the dog because every clinic I've spoken with people have come in when they could get in and everything that we've offered they said yes let's yeah do it. yeah that yeah another thing that is really kind of kind of setting us on fire is because we have so much more work to do because people are saying yes to yeah our typical service yeah. offers, which they typically will procrastinate on. And so now it's all, all yeses. And that makes it very difficult. And the workflows are yeah, uh, are harder with the curbside. Of the yeah. workflows that they yeah. had. So it makes things a little more difficult. It makes things challenging. So I think you have to, when you're thinking about I'm hating life right now, are you just hating today or the pandemic? Or, you know, did you feel this way before the pandemic hit? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've got to be realistic. There's no job you can go to that's going to pay you a zillion dollars and have no problems and you're going to work, you know, 15 hours a week, not happening, no, you know, not at all. Um, not at all. I mean, you can, you can work 15 hours a week, but you're not going to make, you know, no, you're going to 40 hours a week or the money. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right yeah yeah exactly yeah. unless exactly. you're like some kind of a tech genius that right exactly or you're bill gates or you know somebody with, with a brilliant mind yeah exactly yeah so yeah you're right i mean i think that's a really good point because i've worked um in retail as a manager i've worked in like a wholesale jewelry company i've worked in the restaurant business uh my grandfather my father were tobacco farmers i've worked in the fields everything has something that's great and everything has something that sucks mm -hmm. you just have to determine how what your attitude is toward that and and look back I always used to teach my team when you know you'd have death week right you're working yeah. in, in the hospital and like everything that you've been working on for 20 years all dies of yeah uh, but I always said look it's really cycle of life because next week we'll be all puppies and kittens yes we yes so is it really just today? Yeah. What we're seeing is that, that a couple of negative clients that came in that just chewed you up. But if you look over a year's period of time, how many people brought you food and flowers and, yeah. and praise and sent cards? So all those positives really should be first and foremost in your mind because 90% of our clients are great. Yeah, they are. Yeah. You know, even now in the pandemic, when we've got some really terrible ones, 90% mm -hmm. are great. No, and that's the thing. And I think it's, you know, it, it's like a lot of people are talking now about how you need to have a gratitude book or something. Mm -hmm. And I've actually kind of thought about that. I don't do that, but I've been kind of thinking about starting it. And I thought, like, what would I say? And then I thought, well, see, that's the problem right there. We tend to think about the negative things. And particularly like if you're a consultant, you're like, what, what things do I need to solve here? You know, and we don't automatically think think of the good things and the 90% of the clients that are great. And so, yeah, a lot of it is attitude, which I, I think is sort of what you're saying, right? Yeah. yeah. You kind of it train is. your brain to look for either positive things or negative things. Mm -hmm. And whatever you tell it to look is what it's going to find. So yep. that mindfulness and gratitude, uh, looking back at big picture, and even in when somebody's being difficult, being curious about why they're being difficult rather than automatically becoming embattled yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and trying to have a war there that, that nobody ever wins, you know, nobody. Ever no, wins. no, exactly. Exactly. Well, and, you know, I was going to say too, in, in spite of, you know, like the dinosaur advice, which, you know, always ends up coming across as suck it up. Um, and I really don't mean it to be that way. Um, there are some practices out there 
doing amazing things, you know, like um, I was watching that um, AHA's veterinary visionary thing last week or two weeks ago or whenever. And there was a woman there talking about how their practice put together a school. And essentially, it was, a, I guess it's like a homeschooling environment. And they had, you know, 10 of the children of the people that work in the practice are going to the school. And obviously, people have to pay for this because you got to, you know, insurance and teachers and whatever. But what it did is it offered flexibility for the people who are um, working at the practice as far as hours, you know, and if the kids need to stay late because the mom has to stay late or whatever, it's all doable there. And there was a, another practice I knew, this was an equine, equine practice somewhere on the East Coast, and um, every everybody that worked there was female and had children, and they totally structured that practice so people could have a home life and take care of their kids and still come in and be an equine practitioner. So there are some practices out there doing some incredibly innovative things, you know, mm -hmm. and making it possible for there to be a whole different model out there. Most practices don't do that. Most practices operate the way they always have, but it is possible, it you is know. Possible. It is possible. I met a group of practice owners in Wilmington, North Carolina, and there were four, all female, and each one of them worked a day and a half a week. Mm -hmm. And they had, but they owned this practice and, and they had employees, but because they were, they went into it that way. And so this is the way we're going to set it up. And then they had lives and, you know, their kids and stuff. And then years ago, Brenda Tassava, when she was managing a uh, practice, she actually had the practice bought a house behind their practice and set up a daycare. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. So these are, these are absolutely things that are possible to do. Yep. And being creative and being flexible. Um, but we've got to think outside of our normal. We've yep. always done it this way. That's exactly right. I, I read this quote today. I, it's so pertinent. I'm going to read it out here. It's uh, uh, Albert Einstein said, everyone is in the prison of his own ideas. So you are only in a prison if you allow yourself. To. If you if you don't stage the big breakout, right? Yeah, yeah right. exactly. And so, I, I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about people who are unhappy with what they're doing and want to move on and want to do something different, number one, maybe few and far between, but you can find these opportunities. You're probably going to have to be flexible. You know, if you want to work at the equine practice in New Jersey or wherever it was located, um, you know, obviously you're going to have to live in New Jersey, right? So you got to say, okay, am I willing to move, you know, but why can't you do that? I mean, why can't you create a practice like that? People do, you know, and it may not be that you, you can hit the ground running, opening it up with all of these new and different ideas, but some of them you can open up with, and there's no reason you can't then have the daycare, have the school, you know, have a practice that works for, um, for people who are in the early years of, of raising their children. So, yeah, it's very doable. It is a doable thing. Yeah. If you just, you're just a little creative. That's all it takes yeah. is creativity. Yeah. Well, Karen, I, you know, I've taken, uh, I've taken up time. We could, you we and could I talk forever. This has really been fun. This a long time. Yeah. So our audience is probably going, wow, this is okay. We're done. Entertaining or we're done. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to you know, say about yourself, about your company? And of course, we're going to post how to reach you, um, it, a favorite book, a favorite quote, um, shout out to a person that got you on your way, anything you want to. Um, you know, I think I've probably, you know, given all of my advice there. Um, yes, reach out if you've got questions about anything that we've talked about here. If you're looking for financial consulting, more than happy to, to talk to people. You know, when we talk about a favorite book, I tend to think of one for veterinary practices, and that's the, um, um, oh, and I'm completely, the E-Myth book for veterinarians. Um, because I think, you know, I think one of the things that really holds up veterinarians is trying to do, and the, you know, now if you're in an ownership or leadership role, trying to do everything yourself, and that is just not doable. So um, um, that's a great, a great book, you know, but I think too, um, and this is a book I actually haven't read yet, but I've been meaning to, it's called Boundaries, and I don't know the author, but I mean, I think part of it too, I think now, you know, you know, I know I say as a part of my advice, you need to be, you need to say yes to things and stuff, but at some point there have to be boundaries as well. And I think particularly, and I'm going to make a 
broad generalization here on gender, but I think as women, we tend just to go, yes, 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 yes. And, and we kill ourselves trying to meet everybody else's expectations. So, you know, it's a balance there between um, saying yes to things that because they're going to help you achieve a long-term goal and saying yes to things just because people want you to do them, you know? So, yeah. So, so yeah. So say yes to the things you want to do. Say yes to the things that excite you to do. Uh, say no to the things that you look at and go, you just feel obligated. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, Karen, thank you very much for. Your I enjoyed this. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, this was fun. It was always so tickled when you said, "Yeah, who doesn't want to talk about their self?" And yeah, <laughs> right. but, but you know, you you by talking about your your journey, you enlighten other people's road. So thank you very much for your time and doing well, that. For all the good was, information you've given us for so many. Years. No, thank you. It was fun. It was interesting. I had to kind of think about it. You know, it made me think a little bit about, okay, like what worked, what didn't work, you know, so it was fun. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.